Hey, hey, welcome back, everybody. Another Wednesday night, Up North Journal Live. Have we got a show tonight? The sun is coming through the windows like you wouldn't believe. I know, I'm going to get a tan sitting over here right now. Compared to the rain that was happening about two hours ago. This time change has still got me kind of messed uh, up. I know, right? It's so. awesome. But it is Wednesday night. we got a great show lined up. Um, we're in April. <laughs> April is uh, pushing close to half over here. Have you shot your bow yet? No. I was going to do it yesterday, but something uh, diverted me away from that. I'm going to start practicing for TAC, yep. Total Archery Challenge. That's coming up. Getting the camper ready. So There you go. Getting the kayaks ready, getting the kayak trailer ready. So yeah, well, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's finally warming up where you can actually go outside and work for a little bit. and There you go. You and know? not freeze to death. Right. right? I was uh, putting down vinyl flooring. Vinyl life proof flooring in my bedroom okay so you can slide across the floor like uh tom cruise yeah exactly okay. all right well, enough it. about tom cruise now let's get into the show tonight <laughs> all right so let's uh let's get things rolling here all right i'm good if my computer will cooperate with me over here who's acting a little finicky earlier there we go here we go stand by and in three two and one welcome back to another episode of the up north journal podcast everybody host mike adams sitting in a balmy cabin tonight with Dan Defall. That's right. We're here. It's live. It's Wednesday night. It's sunny outside. The yeah. time changes. You know, it's nice to see daylight still as we do the show. It is. You know, it's a wonderful thing. It is. So, Absolutely. speaking of wonderful things, let's tell everybody how they can save some money on some wonderful things. That's right. Uh, let's start off with Buck Bates. If you haven't been down to Deer Camp Store, the brick and mortar store down at 15 in Dodge Park in Sterling Heights, you need to get down there. He's adding new things every day, and he's also got the Buck Bates uh, area there. So if you want to go check out BuckBates.com and get 20% off your order, use your promo code UNJ20. I think Lincoln Roan is back. He's back from Gulf Shores. Right? So let's put him to work. Let's give him a call. If you want to save $25 on your order over there at PatrickMax.com, use the promo code UNJ25. Paul over at JPO Game Calls is working a lot of hours, and if you'd like to save 10% off your game call order at jpogamecalls.com, use the promo code UNJ10. Especially with turkey season coming up. Right. The Island Army, I can't tell you this enough. Go check out the website. They got new things coming in every day. They're posting a lot of new toys. There you go. To play with. Uh, if you use the promo code UNJ10, you'll get 10% off your order over there. And last but not least, we are drinking the Lucky Huntsman today. That is right. And next week, we are going to have the new flavor. Which is? Buckzilla Vanilla. Buckzilla Vanilla. I like it. Right? And uh, if you want 10% off your order over there, you use the promo code UNJ10 at DeerCampCoffee.com. Don't forget to pick up your own Up North Journal brew as well. That's right. We have a medium roast for everybody that can... Uh, partake in that so if you love right. coffee deer camp's the place to go exactly <laughs> and if you want to check out the upper peninsula at m123 fm up in newberry in the up of michigan where it is a 38 degrees and they got just a little bit well they got a little bit of snow on the on the road there a little bit and they got obviously the big piles of snow but get over to cedars get a pizza and get some coffee over there from deer camp itself there you go all right so we got that out of the way. I say that uh, we just jump into this, or maybe we should paddle into this show. What do you think? I think we should paddle, <laughs> extremely paddle in, right? There you go. All right. Hey, I want to welcome Tracy Martin to the show all the way from Anchorage, Alaska. Tracy, how are you doing tonight? It's great to be here. Hey, I think I want some of that coffee. That sounds good. You know <laughs> what? I think we could we could make that happen. We could get some shipped up there to you uh, for your next adventure. I imagine you probably use a jet boil while you're out, right? Uh, or, yeah, something similar to that. Something yeah. similar? There you go. We can make that happen. Dan, right. we got to get some coffee up to her. we got to get it. <laughs> I feel like I just scored. <laughs> there you go. You All did. Right. <laughs> Mike Rudell is on. All right. Hey, Mike, thanks for chiming in to, or, uh, tuning in tonight. So uh, Mr. Ginzel is in the house. Mike and he, Allen. And he's shooting his bow because he's got new shoulders. All right. And All right. Nancy Jackson is on as well. I know the question is going to be coming in. Uh, we uh, People are piling in the cabin tonight, so get your questions in, and we will ask along the way here. So, All right, so 
Tracy, we got you on the show tonight. You've actually taken a little bit of time to put the panel down and, and be able to talk because <laughs> you are busy. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a very busy year. It's been a very busy couple of years, but yeah, uh, a lot going on, a lot of activity going on. Well, I first ran across an article. I want to say it was in 2017 when you were entering somewhere, I believe, that either the Detroit River or the St. Clair River and heading down Lake Erie to circumnavigate all the way back down the Atlantic Ocean into the Erie Canal and back up into Lake Erie. Am I right? Well, by then I had uh, modified that plan. That was the original plan, and then reality hit me in the face within two weeks because that was a 10 month long expedition, and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do the St. Lawrence Seaway. So after two weeks, I modified it to just the five Great Lakes. So if you heard about me as I was going down the Detroit River, um, yeah, it was just, I just had um, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario left to circumnavigate. Okay, all right. Well, I, I ran across that article, and it actually popped up on my, I shared it on one of my feeds or pages on Facebook at the time, and it popped up uh, about, um, I guess, back in March, it was, uh -huh. it was, so it was five years, and I, I talked to Nancy about it, and we started talking with Mike, and we're like, yeah, you know, and he started <laughs> telling me the story, and I'm like, well, we got to get her on the show, so, yeah. so that's kind of yeah, how it came about. Yeah, Mike is great. He's a great guy. And, he he is. and Lorraine Thompson says, hi, Tracy, I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her I said hi back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, how, how did you get involved in, in, I mean, kayaking is one thing, but to do these extreme or long trips, um, how did that become a thing for you? You know, I just love being out on the water. I love camping. I love um, canoe camping and kayak camping, and so it just if you if you're doing something that you love and if you're passionate about it you don't want to go back home <laughs> and go back to your nine to five jobs so you just find trips that last a little bit longer and a little bit longer and and then uh, yeah 2017 was definitely a huge trip that was uh, 10 months long wow that's a long trip that's <laughs> a long trip <laughs> i know i mean when you say you, you love things and and you just want to keep going i know uh sunday afternoons really suck <laughs> because <laughs> it, it's pack up the kayak pack up the camper yeah. pack up the bikes whatever and, and it's like driving down i-75 bumper to bumper traffic and you got to go back to reality but uh mm -hmm. the reality is you're you're doing a, a lot of miles i mean we're talking not just days but miles as well uh, yeah it, the trip ended up being 3,592 miles in 10 months wow yeah that was you got nothing on her. No, <laughs> I, I, no, I, I haven't probably done three thousand feet. If, 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 if there was paddle dust, you'd be in it. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the longest trip that that uh, we've taken was I think we did twenty miles there one afternoon, uh, and that was on a river that had some flow to it. So you know, yeah. it wasn't like where you're you're paddling constantly across these these big vast open bodies of water as well. So. Right. Yeah. So, so when did you start into all this? I mean, how did, uh, you know, did you have a regular nine to five job and then you just quit and decide to go 10 months? I mean, how did it all begin? Um, so I've been paddling my whole life. I uh, started out canoeing and then uh, went into the kayaks. But, um, you know, I think I just reached a point in my life where I, my, my mother, what really, what really was the starting point was my mother, um, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer okay. and up to that point i had done two and three week trips up into the bwca the boundary waters canoe area between minnesota and canada but my longest trip had probably been three weeks up there okay um and two weeks before my mother passed away she said if there was anything in my life that i hadn't done yet to do it because you never know how long you had you know she had planned on learning how to swim she had planned on learning how to play a piano. She'd actually bought this huge piano that sat in her living room for 10 years, and she never learned how to play it. And so, um, you know, I had always wanted to do a long expedition trip. I always thought, you know, maybe one day after I retire, you know, you always say one day, one day, one day. Mm -hmm. And um, after she passed away, I just thought, you know, uh, one day is now. And I think the biggest, the biggest, hurdle that anyone has doing a trip like this is how are you going 
to maintain your life at home and your house and your mortgage and be gone, you know, without income coming in. And once you can figure that out, people are smart. If, if you say one day I'm going to do it, then one day it never happens. But if you say I'm going to do it in two years and I'll figure out how to do it, you do. People are smart. You just figure out how to do it. Um, and so I, I told myself um, March of 2017 I was going to do this. It was 2015 and gave myself two years and I just, I just did it. So this wasn't oh. something you just jumped into. I mean, you had a lot of planning before you headed off on the, the very first oh, big trip. De definitely, yeah, definitely. I mean, the logistics of doing something, you know, five Great Lakes and 10 months, that's huge. So um, not, you know, it wasn't just myself doing the logistics. I put out on social media that I was looking for contacts on all five of the Great Lakes. And people were um, really wonderful they're very generous they volunteered to help you know people in different areas said hey i can help in this section i can help in that section um people were offering to come out and bring me some meals people were offering to let me stay in their homes after i got off the water at night i mean the generosity of people on both sides of the border both the u.s and the canadian side was just amazing well that's an interesting uh, point you know you talk about both sides of the border what logistics did you run into trying uh, you know getting in in the different waters you know u.s versus canada was, was that uh something you had to plan ahead for uh yeah most of it i had to research and know exactly what i needed um because with minnesota i actually had to go to one of their offices and get a, a tag for my kayak for minnesota i didn't have to do that with any of the other states that i paddled through on the u.s side as far as paddling um across the border I decided that a Nexus passport was the way to go. Uh, for people unfamiliar with that, it's a passport very specific for people that travel frequently back and forth between the U.S. and Canada only. Uh, so it's only good for Canada. And you have to go through, um, um, like, you have to jump through a lot of special he hoops. You just can't, um, you know, send in your paperwork and get it. You have to go in. Um, and have a, a very specific interview and they interview they do a federal background check they you know it, there's a lot of hoops but if you're willing to jump through all the hoops actually I had to fly into Detroit for this interview I flew in I did the interview and I flew back that night um, but if you're willing to jump through all those hoops it really made traveling back and forth between the U.S. and Canada very easy especially being on the water now when I paddled on the north shore of Superior um, there are no customs um, personnel uh, in, back in that area. So for that section, I had to get a remote border crossing, which was, you know, more paperwork and, and jumping through more hoops. But once you have it, it just makes paddling back and forth so much easier. Okay. Dan, is, you, when you go to Canada uh, for work, Dan, is, is that something similar? It, it, well, you, 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 it's a little bit different because it's a work uh, issue you have a piece of paper that you can present that says hey I'm going to work there okay to a specific location and if you got a passport it helps if you got a mm -hmm. um, the improved license yeah the enhanced, has, yeah, okay. the enhanced gotcha. exactly okay. and then you just present those items to you in, in a way you go and, and you know you don't spend too much time there you do specifically what is, is stated you go to, there to work right so but no I, I get it with and with that as well, the, the whole interview process that she went through, you kind of go through for the enhanced license as well. They do the background check. They ask you a couple questions. They make sure that you are who yeah. you are. Well, when you, when you went for those interviews and you told them, well, I'm going to kayak around Lake Superior, <laughs> did, 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 did they laugh? Well, I, um, I had pamphlets and I had printed off a bunch of documentation and printed off some newspaper articles. So I went very well prepared. Okay. Uh, I had to fly in from Kansas City to Detroit. It was the Office of Homeland Security that I had the interview with. And and I had some, um, I, don't, I don't think I had my logos yet, but I had a bunch of documentation in a folder. And I just handed them the whole folder. Okay. And it really wasn't a big deal. Um, they, they did do a lot of smiling, and one person wanted to write down my website and, and said that she might follow me. But, yeah, I mean, it was it, it was more of 
taking the time to book the airplane flight, to fly into Detroit, then book a, a, a car, get to Homeland Security, do the interview, and then fly back home all within a day. Um, but the interview itself was very smooth and fast. Okay. Yeah, when, once they realize you are who you are and what you're up to, yeah. or, you, you can tell them kind of, okay, <laughs> we get it, what you're here. You ju- you, you're just following through on what you need to follow through yeah. because yeah. You're, you're serious at that point. Right, exactly. And, and, you know, yep, she's Tracy, and she's going to do what she's going to do. She's yeah. not going to smuggle things in her kayak. <laughs> right, right. Not that that kayak's that big <laughs> smuggle thing. I, I, yeah. The pictures of that kayak I'm seeing is like, you don't got much room in that thing. Right, right. <laughs> no, I had to be very selective with, with what I took. Um, the kayak that I used, it's called a surf ski. It was 19 feet long and about 19 inches wide. Yeah, it, it's it's long and narrow, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you, you sit there, and it, it's kind of funny, but, like, you got a picture. It, you, you were able to take a tent and everything. Like you said, you, you learned to pack really well. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I used a solo backpacking tent. It was only six feet long and three feet wide, so it's a very, very small tent. Um, and, you know, a lot of people would be like, you're living in that tent for... 10 months, how are you doing that? But it worked for me. I just, you know, it worked for me, so. Well, and that's and what you, and that's what you yeah. learn, right? It, it, you, you, this is your trip, so you're not packing for anybody else except for you, so you know what's going to work in your situation. Right. You know? And I had 10 months to, you know, tweak things and get rid of things that I didn't use. If I was out for, like, a week stretch and I didn't use it, I didn't take it back with me again. I was going to um, say, did you practice? Like... Um, no, my practice was just getting on the water every day and just doing it. I did have a support driver. His name was Bill Noble. He was a retired gentleman from the kayaking club I was a member of. He actually um, took, he was with me for nine out of the ten months driving my uh, truck and trailer that I had. So, you know, sometimes I was sleeping in a warm trailer, but most of the time I was out camping and just being out on the water. But what I figured, but what I discovered was during the warm months, I didn't even take a stove with me. I just uh, cooked everything, warmed everything, went on campfires. I only took a stove with me during the really cold months. Okay. Okay. The stove, that yeah. was, was it for the tent or to cook on? No, to cook on. A, oh. a small little, you know, fuel stove. But right. It was just a tiny little Coleman that you just screwed on top of a canister of fuel. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what, we're... Uh, we're bumping up here on our first break, so let's and we got some questions. Like, yeah, uh, we, I, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> and hopefully, we're going to answer some of those along the way. So, uh, we're going to step outside, and we'll be right back after this. Okay. All right. Keep those questions, Pat. Lorraine is from Canada, by the way. Oh, we got somebody that's on the the live stream from Canada. Nice. Yeah, she was a follower. She was really great. Awesome. You you still stay in touch with a lot of these people, I assume. Oh, um, a lot, yeah, like a lot of them. Okay. Uh, New York and um, Bob and Patty from New York, and then Mike from Lake Erie, and there's people from Lake Superior. Um, there's not really anyone from Lake, well, yeah, and then there's a couple from Lake Michigan, too. So, yeah, every okay. lake that I paddled on, I stayed in touch with people that offered to help. How close did you get to Chicago? I paddled through Chicago. Yeah. I, I paddled through the <laughs> harbor sur- of Chicago. And, and survived. And survived. Yeah. I, I called that the harbor from hell. It was horrible. <laughs> it was uh, awful. Uh, Danny and I both hate Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> uh, I, I, I spent uh, four months at a school out there, and I came home with my tail between my legs because I absolutely hated it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know, right? All right. Here we go. Stand by in three, two, and one. Welcome back. Second segment of the show. Uh, we're paddling our way through the show. No pun intended. See what I did right. there? I see what you did there. Um, you know, as we start this off, we're talking about your adventures. Uh, one of the questions that, that, that has come up was, have you kept a journal or a logbook of all these adventures that you're on? Okay. I do. That's interesting you would ask me that. So I was writing um, a book based on all of my journal entries. Every night in my tent, I write down journal entries of what happened. And I actually started writing a book. Um, and the book is like 90% done. However, when I reached out to publishers, um, the book is so long or so 
thick that they were like, oh yeah, we gotta cut this, you cut that. And so I sort of shied away and put the project down just because, um, you know, what part of my trip do you cut when, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm just too close to it. But at some point, I, I think I'm just gonna hand it off to someone and say, here, here it is, uh, can you publish this? But yeah, it was, it's, you know, it's 10 months of, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. it was struggling for um, staying warm. Sometimes it was, there were times I was struggling for my life. There was funny moments and beautiful moments and magical moments. So yeah. Right. Yeah, I, so I do have a journal. Volumes one, two, three, four, five, right. six. Right. <laughs> yeah. okay. All the, people do that. So okay, so that leads yeah. to let, let, let's go to the second question. With that, is what was the scariest moment on the water during all these adventures? Uh, Tobermory, paddling around Tobermory. Um, so there was a storm coming in from the east, and I knew that the storm was going to be hitting me in a few days. Um, and I had to get around the, the point around Tobamori because then I'm paddling up the other side of Lake Huron going up towards uh, Port Huron. I'd be protected from the wind and, and from the storms that were coming on. Once the storm system hit, it was, it was going to be 30 mile per hour winds and there was no way I was gonna be able to paddle um, on Lake Geor um, Georgian Lake anymore, Georgian Bay. So I really pushed the envelope. I um, paddled 42 miles across the bottom portion of um, Georgian Bay. I started paddling up the shoreline towards Tobermory, and I was about 20, and we're talking over the course of two days, two, three days. I was 20 miles from Tobermory, and I got caught in the storm, and, um, um, you know, it was dark. It was night. I kept pushing the envelope, and I said, okay, I got to get, to the next beach, I gotta get to the next beach, and the next thing I knew, the storm hit, the winds were cranking up, the sun set, and there was just cliffs, and there was no more beach to pull off at, and I had to paddle for another two and a half hours in a raging storm with, in the dark with no beaches. <laughs> okay. So that was, that was the scariest moment of so that entire trip. What do you dig, dig down deep into when that's happening, and you, you know you gotta, go somewhere to get safe mm -hmm. where do you go in your mind at that point what do you what are you thinking and, and how do you overcome that that fear you go you go into survival mode it's um there's no room for emotions there's no room for crying there's no room for panicking because if you do that you're going to die so you in your mind um you just focus on keeping the boat upright and the waves you know i couldn't really see the waves but i've been on the great lakes for you know, uh, six, seven months by then. Um, I could I could anticipate the, the fill of the water. I could sort of anticipate the waves hitting my boat. So I would lean uh, to the right as the big waves were coming off of Georgia Bay and crashing into me. I'd lean to the left when I, when I felt like there was rebound coming from the cliffs. And it was a storm of lightning. So every now and then the lightning would flash and then I could, um, straighten the boat up and keep my bearing um, along the shoreline because otherwise it was sort of pitch black out there. And you just go into survival mode. And, and every now and then when I felt like the boat was going to tip over, with a surf ski, you can put your feet in the water to stabilize you out a little bit. Sort of, um, um, it helps with balance. And every now and then I'd throw my feet in the water and I would start to feel panicky like I'm going over now. Um, and then you just push that panic down, you just push it down so I don't have time for this and get your feet back in the belt and keep paddling forward. And it's, you're just in survival mode. And um, I had contacted my support driver, Bill. He was standing on the only beach out there, um, a sandy beach with a huge uh, spotlight. And he, um, I was out there for two and a half hours before I got to him and then he brought me in safely and the moment that my feet hit the, the ground, I sort of had a meltdown. Right. But out on the water, you, you, you don't, you can't melt down out on the water because if you do, you'll die. Right. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, you got it. Like you said, you kicked into survival mode, and you paddled, paddled, paddled. You did everything what you needed to do to stay upright, not go go over. And what was the the, the your thought when you saw that spotlight? 
when I saw the spotlight, I knew I'd be safe because up to that point, I was surrounded by cliffs and I thought if, if the waves split me out of my boat, the waves are going to pick me up and pound me to the cliffs and I'm going to be nothing but hamburger. When I saw the spotlight, even though I was still about half a mile out, um, I knew that even if the boat, even if the boat got flipped over, I, you know, I had on a dry suit, I had on a life jacket, I knew I could swim towards that spotlight. I would abandon the boat and swim towards that spotlight. Um, so I, I felt like I was safe once I hit that spotlight. It was, but I, I didn't want to flip out on my boat. I didn't want to get into the water because there's always that voice in the back of the head saying, no, that's a bad idea. You don't want to be in the water. You can't swim to that spotlight. You're too far out. The waves are too, too big. Mm -hmm. Stay in your boat and get to, to shore. But um, it was, it made me feel safe seeing that light and knowing Bill was on the beach. It brought your it brought your focus in too, right? You could focus on something you could actually you see instead of yeah. instead of black, yeah. right? Yeah. Like like right. you said, you know, you and got that focus point. Yeah, um, I was focused on feeling the waves. I was focused on trying to anticipate when the waves were hitting me because I couldn't see the waves unless the lightning was flashing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once I saw the spotlight, I started focusing on the spotlight definitely. You know, something you had mentioned, you talking about taking and, and getting your feet out, trying to stabilize the boat. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you didn't have a spray skirt. How, how big of, the, of the, the the cockpit is open at that point in your boat? I mean, the whole, as with the surf ski, the whole thing is open. Um, you cannot swamp a surf ski. Okay. As long as you don't damage the hull, you can't swamp it. Um, as long as you're paddling forward, it self bails. So you do have a foot well. And the footwell could fill up with maybe two feet of water, okay. um, maybe um, um, probably one foot of water. But as long as you're paddling forward, it's self bell So, you know, the waves would come in, but I'm moving forward, and so it's always self bailing um, Yeah, so, um, and the thing about the surf ski, you know, people would say, oh, why aren't you in a sea kayak? You know what, for me, a sea kayak, would not have worked. I preferred the surf ski. I, I imagined I was like this little brown duck bobbing up and down on these waves. It's like, you know, the first time I was out on Lake Huon when I first started my trip and I got these huge big waves. I mean, it's like an ocean out there. Mm -hmm. You got these huge big waves and I started to white knuckle my paddle, but then I noticed that these little brown ducks were just bobbing up and down about a care in a world, a world with, in these huge four foot waves. And, you know, with the ocean, you get these big, huge swells. Mm -hmm. So a four-foot wave is nothing. But on the Great Lakes, they're coming at you fast and hard. They're not swells. It's just huge wave, huge wave, huge wave. And so it's totally different. And But the surf ski just sort of bobbed on top of the waves. And so in my mind, I'm just like, I kept saying, I'm a little brown duck bobbing on top of the waves. There's nothing to worry about. And um, you make mistakes when you're afraid. But if you can not be afraid you um you're a lot safer out there yeah fear can get into your mind and, and it can take you to some bad places quick uh and yeah. instead of focusing on the task at hand so so when you you when you decided which kayak to use was, were you going off of experience of using a sea kayak using the all the other kayaks out there to decide which kayak you were going to use um yes so my um, experience with paddling ever since I was like 18 years old was always a canoe. I switched over to a sea kayak, um, I think it was like 2017, no, 2007, sorry. 2007, I bought my first sea kayak from a canoe. And a sea kayak, you know, I have arthritis in my knees. I've had rheumatoid arthritis. So my knees, it's hard to bend my knees to get into them. Um, and my right leg would go numb, my right foot would go numb. And so I really didn't like the sea kayak. A friend of mine who paddles surf skis, which is an open design, and your legs are supported, um, said, here, try this belt. I got in the belt and I loved it. I loved how, you know, you lean to the right, you lean to the left. I mean, the balance on a surf ski is so much different. And so you're keeping yourself upright based on how you lean, keeping your back straight, keeping your core tight. And it's open, so like, I would struggle. When I first started paddling, I struggled to get into a sea kayak. 
um, I learned how to get into a surf ski in like under one minute. If I fall out, I can climb right back into it. Based on my years of experience, uh, I'm getting ready to do another expedition in a sea kayak. I actually went out and practiced self-rescue and I, I self-rescue in the sea kayak now the same way I taught myself to do in a surf ski and I can get right into it now. But back then when I was still young, people would be like, oh, you gotta do it this way. Oh, you have to use a paddle flow. Oh, and <laughs> it just didn't work for me. So for me, a surf ski is just the better boat. So the only down, yeah, That's the only the downside. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't like the paddle boat that I cannot get back into self rescue. Well, that makes you're sense. Not, yeah, because you're not always paddling with other people. You got to be able to get back into your own boat. Yeah, by yourself. That, yeah. that's the whole point. No, it, that makes perfect sense. Um, that's something that before I get out into something big, that's the one thing that, that we're, we're going to start doing this summer is learning that. Uh, you know, talk talk just briefly about that. I mean, how, how do you go about getting back in? You said you learn how to, to get into both the same right. way. So with a surf ski, you're attached to your boat, and your paddle is attached to your boat. If if, um, if you're not attached to your belt and you flip over your surf ski, it's gone. The wind's taking it and it's gone. So you fall over and I just go ahead and let go of my paddle. I swim to the side of the boat. And so the paddle is floating there with the, with the paddle leash on. I swim to the side of my belt. I, I push up on the far back. I get my, my belly over the seat. Um, and then I just slide my butt in and put my legs in and I'm in. And then I just pick my paddle up that's floating next to the belt because it's attached with the paddle leash and I'm back in. There you go. Literally, it takes me less than a minute to get back into a sea kayak. I mean, get back into a surf ski. You know, and, and talking about... Very, and it's, it's, just, it's just about practice and balance. How, how much, like, the practice, like, just that for one thing, but, you know, mm -hmm. these trips as well in the gear and everything. I mean, you said you take them with you, and if you didn't mm -hmm. use it in that first week, then you got rid of it. But I mean, mm -hmm. getting getting to the point where you're really comfortable to, to go out on a trip, how much of, of these things do you practice, and for how long? Um, well, there's a race across the state of Missouri called the MR340, 340 miles across the state of Missouri. And I did that race nine years in a row, and to train for that race, I was out in my belt all the time. Mm -hmm. I was paddling, the Missouri River flows at about four miles an hour. Okay. I would put in on the Missouri and paddle upstream against the current. Um, I would go downstream like 50 miles to the next town and have someone pick me up. I would do interval training on a local lake. So to train for these long distance endurance races, I was in my belt constantly like I'd get off work in the morning I'd have my belt on top of my car I'd go to a local lake and I would train for an hour on my days off I'd be training for three and four hours so um I had a lot of time in the belt and when I'm saying training I'm talking about a surf ski I had a lot of time training in these boats um and every time every single time I'd go out onto the water to train I would always um fall in the water on purpose so I could practice self-rescue. I'd practice self-rescue on the river, I'd practice self-rescue on the lake. And sometimes I'd go out in conditions that people would, you know, on a lake that people would say, hey, you shouldn't be out there, just so I could practice self-rescue. Because almost anyone can get back in their boat if it's flat and calm and no wind. Absolutely. But that's not when you're gonna fall out of your boat. You're gonna, get, you're gonna get out when it, the when it's crappy. Yep. So I would purposefully go out in crappy conditions just to practice self-rescue. Yeah. That well, is a great point. Well, that whole purpose of recreating what you might be out there, you know, on these long journeys, you're not going to have the whole entire time of perfect weather. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're going up against Mother Nature who can turn on a dime of what yeah. to throw at you. But, yeah, to go out there, that would be like going just practicing in a pool with no weight. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Say, okay, now I'm ready for the Great Lakes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. Even yeah. when we had Mike on, yeah. Dell, you know, he would be out there practicing. You know, he had people from the shore kind of worried. He's like, oh, it's okay, okay, I'm just practicing. I'm practicing. I'm, I'm meant yeah. to do this. Right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and we talked about your equipment that you, 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 you whittled through. Uh, what do you think is your three most important pieces of equipment that must go with you on these long journeys? 
a dry suit, a paddle, and a life jacket. Bar none. Got to have them. <laughs> yeah. Got to have them. Right? Yeah. So yeah. there you go. You know, and, you know, you got to have them. And Mark Coleman says, um, your your analogy of your little brown duck would make a good book title. <laughs> Tell him I said thank okay. you. <laughs> Mark is always uh, coming up with book titles and wanting people to write books. So there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, during your practice sessions, are, are, when you're practicing, you say practice, mm -hmm. are you practicing like when you're paddling? Are you are you building stamina? I mean, are you just like power power paddling, or are you practicing technique paddling? What what are you, what are you doing during that time? Um, probably at this point, I'm not practicing technique as much. I mean, I have my way of paddling. Um, someone who's really into technique might even say I'm paddling incorrectly, but for me, it works. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I'm putting time in the boat. Okay. I'm, I'm I'm doing interval training, which means I go out to the lake and I just paddle. I give it 110% across, I rest as I turn the bed around, I give it 110% back across, and it's just um, fast speed, um, giving it everything we have, just interval training, like okay. someone is just running sprints. Um, then I would go out on the Missouri River, and I would do some long distance paddling on my day off. I'd be out there for eight, um, 10 hours paddling downstream if I could find someone to pick me back up. And then uh, the rest of the time, I'm strength training by paddling against the current. It's a four mile per hour current. So I'm out there paddling against the current, and I go, go, go. And then I might sit and let the current drift me backwards for a bit just to drink something and, okay. and recover for, you know, five minutes or so. I mean, you've got to just gotta keep going because, you know, that's, it's a fast current. So those were my three. And then, um, you know, I would do some other types of stuff. Like I, before my knees got really bad, I jogged, and I like to do 5Ks and 10Ks. I did some triathlons. Um, but at this point, it's just mostly just time in the boat and just paddling. Okay. Not, nothing yeah. in a gym or anything like that, then? It's just oh, no, no, I, no, I go to the gym, too. I, okay. I, yeah, I go to the gym, and I, I lift weights. I, um, I lift a lot of weights. Okay, so, so with that, you know, you're out on these big adventures and that. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, have you ever had, you know, obviously you went up against Mother Nature and she's mm -hmm. playing with you with lightning, but have you ever had a health emergency while you're out on the water? And if you, if, if so, it, but well, also, would you, have, would you have practiced something like that too? Thinking, okay, something happened to my leg or my arm, uh -huh. and you practice that. So did, first question is, did you ever have a health emergency out on the water? Oh yeah, quite a few. Um, I'm highly allergic to insect stings. My face will swell up, my eyes will swell closed. Um, it happened on the Great Lakes, um, I don't know, three or four times. And so I carried Benadryl with me for that. Um, there was one time, the very first time on the Great Lakes, it was May 1st, or no. No, it was June 1st. It was the last day. It was after May. It was June 1st, and I decided it was a warm, sunny day. It was supposed to be 70 degrees out, and I decided not to paddle with my dry suit that day, and that was a huge mistake. I, I ended up with hypothermia um, and having to um, manage that when I got off the water. But um, I never got hurt as far as cuts or injuries or anything like that. I tried to be very careful. Um, I did have like a very, very small first aid kit with me, Ma mainly just carried Benadryl in it. Um, so I was very lucky in regards to being out in really remote areas and never having any major um, issues with injuries, I suppose. Absolutely. I mean, like you said, you, you just carry the necessity of Benadryl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, talking about uh, the, the training and, and preparing, uh, whether it be health related or whatever, Along with health and training is diet and nutrition. Um, the caloric intake that you would have to sustain to be able to paddle as far as you do in one day uh, and keep it up at a sustained pace for, for months. Mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of foods do you, do you take with you or do you eat or is it, you know, how do you, how do you overcome that? So with the, on the Great Lakes, um, my nutrition was really, really bad as far as food because I was basically just eating high calorie stuff. I would carry um, 
you know, several packets of bagels, like blueberry bagels, plain bagels, cinnamon raisin bagels, and a jar of peanut butter that I had mixed honey into the peanut butter. And, you know, on the days that during the summer months when I decided carrying a stove was just too much um, extra gear, I didn't need the stove and I would just make campfires. Sometimes that's all I had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner was uh, bagels with peanut butter and honey on. Um, which was high calorie foods. I would have protein bars. Uh, sometimes I took Snickers with me. Um, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> yeah, so I was more focused on the calorie, regardless if it was bad calories. Uh, when I did the Mississippi River, uh, the entire length of the Mississippi River, I focused more on better calories and better nutrition, and I tried to stay away from just the crap calories mm -hmm. and then on um, my upcoming trip I'm totally focused on an, a gluten-free diet and making sure that the nutrition is really really good because as I get older you know I have rheumatoid arthritis um, nutrition really plays an important part in, in staying healthy and being able to do this stuff absolutely well I tell you what we're, we're bumping up here on our next break uh, we'll continue talking about going through this uh, when we come back but you also mentioned about your upcoming trip we want to make sure that everybody who's listening stay tuned because at the end of the show we're going to talk about that as well in the last segment so we're going to step outside we'll take our next break and we'll be right back after this all right folks keep those questions coming in mike rudell says the bee sting Oh, what, else, what else is a bee going to do when he's flying out there and sees a lone kayaker? Right. Yeah, they're going to find me and sting me is what right. they do. Right. That would be me. <laughs> oh, that's a good question, Mark Coleman. We'll have to ask that one. I like that one. That's a good question. All righty. Here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. All right. We, we've covered uh, practice. We've covered nutrition. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the gear. You've got a question there. You said you wanted to come yeah, back. Yeah, I got. I got. So, so if you said you worked nights and you carried your kayak on top of your car. Mark mm -hmm. Coleman wants to know what are you driving that can haul a 19 foot kayak all <laughs> over the state? <laughs> <laughs> I was driving a small little uh, Rav4, Toyota Rav4 that had uh, kayak um, racks on top and. It would, uh, you just have to center, center the, the kayak on top of the racks and then tie it down with um, balanced storm lines as well as straps. Absolutely. But yeah, I just, I just went everywhere with it. So right. you run J hooks on top then? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there you go, yeah. J hooks. Uh, what are you using now though? Um, well, I, I have a pretty much the same setup as same I did setup. back okay. then. That's I don't have I don't have the RAV4 anymore. Okay. Um, but I do have the same setup. Yeah. Okay. And so a ski is light enough, I just, you know, pick it up and set it on top and strap it down and go. What's the total weight of, uh, of your ski? Um, if it didn't have all the modifications, I think it's like twenty nine pounds, but with all the modifications it's probably more like thirty eight pounds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very mad. And that's that's not loaded. It's, it's mm -hmm. a lot heavier if it's loaded. I have um, I have a Stellar SR Expedition. They actually designed that belt based on my 2017 expedition around the Great Lakes. Um, so it's a surf ski that has front and rear hatches, and it has um, more straps, so you can strap stuff down. So it's a great design. It's a great belt. I actually own two of them. Okay, we're looking at one of uh, the one here. You've got uh, a solar panel on it, it looks like. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Talk yeah, about that a little bit. Um, well, I had to have a way of recharging my, my phone, of recharging. I had I power with music or an audio book. I had to be able to recharge all my electronics. I also had, um, you know, um, cameras and just, you know, everything mm -hmm. that's electronic. So the solar panel, I would keep it on the back of my boat to so strap it down it would charge all day to a battery and then you switch out the apparatus and plug your electronics directly into the, the ports which came out right off the battery it's sort of like a, a smaller I guess like a motorcycle battery okay um, and I would keep the battery in a dry bag the solar panels could be you know they were like very durable they could be with you know salt water fresh water, sand, rocks. Um, I think there's a video of someone shooting one with a gun and it's still putting out power. <laughs> um, so yeah, the solar panels are very durable, but then the battery was the, the thing I had to 
protect and, and keep in a dry bag and stuff while you paddle. So I think in that picture, you should see a green dry bag. The battery is in the green dry bag okay. that's attached to the solar panels. Okay. Uh, running a marine radio, I would assume, as well, right? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And um, so the marine radio was really important not only to um, – it was also, you know, I could tell the weather. I would always listen to it when I was in my tent before I went to bed at night and before I took off in the morning to make sure that the weather conditions were uh, favorable for paddling or if a storm was brewing, when did I need to be off the water? And any time that it looked like a storm, you know, the clouds were getting dark or the wind was picking up, I was turning it on and listening to the weather reports. I could also talk to my ground crew if, if my support driver was nearby, like within a mile or so, I mean, I could talk to him. And then I could talk to the passing boats too. Okay. Did you have much communication with, with passing boats? I mean, do people like, say, what are you doing out here? <laughs> um, not too much. I mean, on the Detroit River, um, you know, I had to let them know. The Detroit River, I didn't, I felt like that wasn't very well marked. So you would see, um, huge boats coming at me, uh, both from the U.S. side and from the Canadian side, and, you know, I'm just trying to figure out where they're going. And so I radio them and let them know I was out there. Being in a surf ski so low into the water, it was really hard for them to see me. But I would uh, have a conversation with them on the radio and let them know, hey, I'm out here, this is where I'm at, where do you want me to go? That was always important. I always asked them, where do you want me to go to get out of your way? You know, that's it, it, a good point, uh, and I, I've had this conversation with Nancy before, when, especially when we first started kayaking together. We, you know, we, we canoe a lot of the streams and rivers here in Michigan, and people are fishing on them, uh, mm -hmm. especially fly fishing, and we'll, we'll come up on somebody in the water, and I'm like, which side do you want me on? And they kind of look at me, I'm like, well, where do you, I don't want to blow the hole out. Tell me oh, where, yeah, where yeah, do you yeah, want yeah, me right? to go to stay out yeah. of your way, you know, and that's... Yeah. I can see that with a big boat, though, like especially the freighters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the freighters were really scary. Um, when I was paddling across Lake Michigan into Chicago, the um, one came up on me, and I was, like, trying to get out of its way. And then on the St. Mary's River, one came up behind me. And he didn't, the one on the St. Mary's River didn't even see me. Usually they'll blow the horn once to let them know that they see you and to get out of the way, and they'll blow the horn three times to say, hey, I'm going to run you down if you don't get out of my way. Right. They, 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 don't, they can't really change direction. You have to get out of their way. Yeah. This, this one, I got a, I was paddling on the, on the St. Mary's River, and I got this bad feeling that, you know, like the hair on the back of my neck was standing up, and I turned to look behind me, and the freighter was right on top of me. Wow. And he hadn't blown his horn. I don't think he saw me. And by the time I got out of his way, way when he passed me, um, he was less than 20 yards from me. No way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> I, was, I was shitting my pants. <laughs> you know what? You, you were literally looking up at the boat going, yeah, this is it, because that's a very big boat. And you're right. Well, they're they're no. pretty silent. They, yeah. they can... When you're out there, yeah. you hear that low drum, but that's, that, you, you that's sit it. there and obviously, you, you, like you said, you got that feeling, and all of a sudden you yeah. kind of look, and you're like, Oh my, am I in trouble? Did, did you give him a, well, a one finger wave? <laughs> no, I was too busy paddling. <laughs> right. I was too busy paddling. So it was really bizarre because my brain, that first look, my brain just couldn't comprehend what I was looking at because I looked behind me and then looked forward. And, and then it took my brain a second to, to comprehend that it was a big freaking barge right on top of me and then I had to look a second time and then I started cussing and <laughs> paddling out of his way towards the shoreline but it was like yeah I, I don't I was it, it almost got me <laughs> you, you know you, you you mentioned you know you're going through all these like, the Great Lakes and all these lakes and every place that you go and one of the questions that uh, you mentioned that you had to register your kayak in one state Minnesota was mm -hmm. there anything any other places that you had to do that and have you ever been stopped by any conservation officers while I'm on the water? Oh, I got stopped in Minnesota twice. They wanted to make sure that they that the Minnesota tags was on my boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, no other state requires that. If, if your boat, because I had my boat licensed or uh, registered in Missouri, if your kayak is registered in another state, 
Uh, usually all the other states will recognize that state. When I paddled the Great Lakes, Minnesota at that time did not recognize. Um, you had to have a Minnesota tag on your kayak. I've been told that that has changed now. Um, but back when I paddled the Great Lakes in 2017, I had to have a Minnesota tag on my boat. And, and I got checked twice on the beach to make sure that that tag was on my boat. And I was in Minnesota the least of any of the states. And they were like on top of it. They were like, they were on top of it. They're looking for they're, money. I was just about to say, they're looking, they're looking for their... Because you know that's going to yeah. be a couple hundred dollar ticket. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're looking for that easy cash. And well, <laughs> I think just simply paddling in a kayak here in Michigan, I mean, they don't have to be registered because it's not a motorboat. But if you don't have a life jacket with you in oh, yeah. a kayak, you gotta have even a kayak, you, it's, I think it's a hundred or $150 fine. It, it's pretty steep. So. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to get their money if you don't have what you, <laughs> what you're supposed to. Yeah, it's just easier just to give them what they want and just move on. Yeah. Is there <laughs> anything that, that you didn't have with you that you wish you would have taken now that you look back at it? Um, the one thing that I wish the first couple of weeks of my trip, um, I wish I would have had a second cell phone. And so I went home because um, there was about a two-week period where the ice moved in, it was impossible to paddle anymore. And I went home and I bought a second cell phone to have with me as a backup and a drive back. Because I was out there paddling in remote areas, it was cold. The cold was one, sucking the battery life out of my phone. And then two, I was using my phone for navigation. I was using my phone to talk to ground support. Um, and there were several times that I was out there and the battery on my phone just went dead and I was sort of on my own. I had no communication. Um, at one point, um, my ground crew actually called um, the sheriff's department because they were like, she's out there somewhere behind the ice and we can't get in touch with her, we can't find her. So the very first thing that I did when I went home for those two weeks waiting for the ice to melt was I bought a second cell phone. And I kept it in a dry bag, and I kept it uh, within reach. Um, I had a dry bag that I kept on the back of my hatch that had all my emergency stuff. I had flares. I had, um, um, I think I had bear spray in it, too. But it was just emergency stuff, and I had a cell phone and a dry pouch in that emergency bag. So okay, um, it helped a lot. But um, besides that, I really can't think of anything else that I didn't have. I mean, I had researched what I needed to do and talk to people. There was uh, a gentleman from uh, Lake Michigan. He had paddled all five of the lakes one lake a year. It actually took him two years to paddle Lake Superior. Um, so in six years, he had circumnavigated all five of the Great Lakes. And I, I was talking to him constantly. I actually went to his house and had sat down with him and, and talked to him. And um, he was a great help. Okay. Well, the one thing yeah. that I was thinking about after we had talked uh, a couple weeks back, so you, you did Huron, you've done uh, Lake Michigan and, mm -hmm. and Superior. Going from Huron up into Superior, did you paddle through the locks? Oh, yeah. I paddled through the sea locks. They say that's quite the experience. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen people yeah. talk about that. It was fun. It was my very first set of locks that I ever paddled through, and it was definitely fun. I mean, you're in the locks with uh, motorboats, and um, and then paddling out of the lock, you know, the water can be pretty crazy and swirly. But um, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. And you, there's two sets of locks. There's the American side, which has all the freighters, and then there's the Canadian side that has all the smaller boats, the canoes and the kayaks. So when first you have to cross over. And so you're, and there's a lot of freighter traffic out there. So you're having to cross over and make sure you're not getting plowed down because those boats move fast. And then once you get through the locks, you got to cross back over. It, it can be a little bit intimidating when you're out there by yourself doing that. But yeah, they're, they're a little bit bigger. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're a little bit bigger. Speaking of intimidating. You know, we talked about Mother Nature, and we talked about, you know, if there's any been any emergency health issues, but uh, has there been any run-ins, funny, scary, or amazing run-ins with wildlife? Um, you know, there really hasn't. My goal was to avoid 
anything bigger than myself. And so I did a really good job of avoiding. Um, the one thing about the wildlife, I loved the ducks and the birds. Uh, during spring migration and fall migration on the Great Lakes, it's just spectacular. And people would ask me, you know, how could you be, you be out there by yourself? Well, I really wasn't because I had all of the ducks and all the birds and, and geese and swans and pelicans. And um, so I really gained a huge appreciation for, um, for the birds. Sometimes I would sit um, in camp and I watched some of the, the smaller little birds like run up and down the beach. And um, I don't know, but I really, you know, in my tent, you know, sometimes there would be the raccoons and the foxes. Um, but you know, I really didn't have any 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 strange encounters. Sorry. I I preferred ha I preferred camping on rock islands. So anytime I could find a rock island, I'd camp on that. Uh, I tried to avoid any any confrontation with any bears. I would usually pull off at 4 p.m. And, and cook my dinner and eat my dinner, and then I would get back on my boat and paddle to sun, you know, about an hour before sun. So I could get my my entire camp set up in about 35 minutes. So I would paddle almost up to sunset and then set my camp up so there was no smell of any food uh, around my tent or around my camp because my whole goal, because yeah, I didn't have a gun. So my whole goal being out there was to um, not attract a lot of wildlife. So you didn't get the uh, territorial bird dive bombing you as your kayak? Oh my God, I did. Yes, I did do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess I must have gotten too close to a nest. Not It wasn't an eagle. It was the birds that um, look a lot like eagles. I can't remember their name. Um, they're a little bit smaller, but yeah, that was dive bombing. It wasn't very happy. I think I, I was paddling along um, some cliffs, and I think maybe I was too close to its nest or something, but it was it was not happy. I, I was like waving my paddle at it to <laughs> keep it from dive bombing me. I'm glad you mentioned that. I totally forgotten about that. Because <laughs> it's like, well, now hold on. Wait, if you're paddling to <laughs> all these birds, you've got to run into yeah. something territorial. Yeah, yeah. That's just, if you didn't, that'd be awesome. But yeah, no. <laughs> See? So you luckily didn't steal your hat. <laughs> got to add that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I lost a lot of uh, sunglasses, prescription sunglasses, and I lost a few hats. But not to the birds, just through my own stupidity. But, um, yeah, when I paddled the Mississippi River, the amount of wildlife was just amazing. I saw more wildlife within the, probably the first month on the Mississippi than if you don't count the birds and what I did on the whole Great Lakes. Wow. Wow. But, but I was trying to avoid the wildlife, too. So. Right. Great. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We're, uh, let's take our last break yep. and come back. Uh, we'll spend the rest of the time. I got, I got a question I want to ask you about the, the first trip, the one that I was talking about when we first started the show. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, we also want to make sure that we get in about w something that's coming up. Right, because well. Mark Coleman asked, yeah. what's next? Any huge plans? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, stay huge. tuned, Mark, because you're about to hear. Huge, yeah. huge plans. Right? <laughs> We're talking huge. Huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. right. We'll be right back after this. Okay. All right, last segment of the show. Mark Coleman, we're going to ask that question, and you're going to get a huge answer. <laughs> we're going to make paddling great again. <laughs> great. All right. That's funny. Bird dive bombing. Yeah, <laughs> I that, totally walking. forgot about that. <laughs> you can do that walking in a park for Right. Yeah. Let's take over, like, the front porch. Right. I, I can't get in my own house. I know, right? Mm. All right. Here we go. Three, two, and one. All right, last segment of the show. I, I swear, there's so many things going through my head. I'm, we could make three or four shows out of this easily. Uh, we just started kind of getting to know a little bit about what you're doing out there. Uh, the very first thing that, that when we started the show, I, I was talking about when you were going to take that long trip and you were going to go you know, around and come back through the Erie Canal. Mm -hmm. With that, when you started that trip, was that the trip where your your ground support crew like bailed on you and partway through the trip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you overcome something like that? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I so he was supposedly a good friend, and um, he had. We, he had promised me for six months in advance he was going to be my ground crew and my 
and my project manager, and he was going to, you know, I don't know. Anyways, um, it was, let's see, it started on Thursday. Sunday morning, so like, what, four days into the trip? Sunday morning at 5 a.m., he woke me up and he said, um, this, is, this is too challenging, and, um, and I don't think the Great Lakes are safe to be paddling in, and I don't want to be responsible for telling your kids that you drowned out there, and so um, I can't do this anymore, and I'm packing up and I'm going home. And I said, because I had bought a camping trailer specific for this based on what he suggested, okay. and I already had my truck, and I bought this camping trailer, and I didn't know how to do the trailer. I, in fact, I said, I don't know what I'm doing with this trailer. I've never owned a trailer, a camping mm -hmm. trailer like this. And he said, don't worry about it. I've got it under control. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he woke me up at like 5 in the morning and said, I'm out of here. And I'm just like, what am I supposed to do? And his exact words were to me were, there's generous people out in the world, someone will step up and help you. And I said, but you're my friend. You're, you promised me for six months. Um, <laughs> I mean, we were like really putting this thing together. Right. And um, so he packed up and, and he left. I think he was gone by 7.30 or 8, 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, I was just sort of numb and dumbfounded. And thinking, okay, I've got a, a truck and a trailer and a boat, and I called someone up and I said, I'm just going to, you know, and it's March, it's like cold, right. and I called someone up and I said, hey, um, I, I don't know, can, if I take everything I can carry, can I park my truck and trailer in your, in your driveway? And they were like, well, I don't think that's a good idea, it's March. So, um, yeah, it was just trying to piecemeal it together. Amazingly, uh, when we started on the beach of Lake Huron, there was a lot of people that came out mm -hmm. to, to wish me well. There were people that gave me their, their phone numbers, and one individual, um, Carl uh, Young, he gave me his business card. He was like a um, lighthouse uh, captain. He, he did lighthouses. And um, he actually gave me his business card, and he said, he said, if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to call me. I'm here to help you. And, you know, and I think, you know, you, when you're trying to get started on that expression, you, you're thinking everyone and, and, mm -hmm. you're, and everything, but you really don't ever think you're ever going to see these people again. Right. So I'm sitting there, and I pull out his card, and he's some stranger. They just gave me a card on a beach. And I call him, and I'm like, Hey, yeah, so <laughs> my support driver has just abandoned me. I'm sitting here with a truck and a trailer. I don't know what I need to do. Um, uh, is your offer still available to help me? <laughs> so him and his wife came out and helped me on Sunday. And, um, and then Monday, the ice started moving back in. So then he and it, everything locked up with ice. So then... Um, so I paddled Sunday with him and his wife, or him and his wife pulling my truck and trailer. And then he got on the phone and put out uh, over the Port Huron area that I was trapped, you know, behind ice. I couldn't paddle anymore. And my support driver had abandoned me. And would anyone let me stay in their home? And so then Brandy Orchard from Port Huron called me up and said, hey, I hear you're having trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and you can bring your truck and trailer and park it in my yard, and I've got a warm bed for you inside the house, and we'll figure this out. So then I drove to Andy, Andy, uh, Randy Orchard and Teresa Orchard, his wife, and they kept me for a week. And then my sister had to quit her or had to put in like a leave of absence for her job in Missouri. Her and her husband came up and was my support driver for about two weeks uh, because the ice melted and then the ice moved back in again. Um, and so I went home for two weeks to wait for the ice to melt and I called Bill Noble who had offered, Bill Noble is an angel. He offered to help me for about a month or two months along the Lake, support, Lake Superior area. Mm -hmm. Uh, he'd done his own expedition when he was in his 30s. He was a retired gentleman. And he just thought it would be fun to drive the section that he had paddled in his 30s. And so he was only offered to help for about a month or two. I called him up, and I'm like, 
Chris left, can you take over for him? Um, because Chris had been his contact person. And he was like, um, well, you gotta give me a week to pack up my house. And I said, done. And he was an angel. He was, and he was with me for the other, for the rest of the nine months. Wow. You know, that's, uh, that's something I've, I've kind of, or we've experienced as well. I mean, people in the outdoors, whether it's kayaking, hunting, fishing, archery, firearms, whatever, horseback riding, we, we all kind of support each other and kind of gel together when times get tough you know you it seems like you always find somebody that'll just pitch in and help out yeah yeah so it was just you know the thing about the great lakes my expedition was just the amazing amount of wonderful kind-hearted and just generous people that i met i mean every state every lake both countries um i mean it was just and, th you know, there'd be times I had these little cards printed off that had my name and what I was doing on my website and all that on it. And I'd pull up to, on beaches and I'd leave it at people's homes or people came down to see what I was doing. I'd hand them out to them. And I pulled up on this one beach. It was on Superior on the Canadian side. And this guy came came out and said, what are you doing on my land? So, I, you know, I gave him the card and, and we were talking. He's like, oh, yeah, sure, camp on my land. Oh, yeah, sure, no trouble. And he left. And then he came back like an hour later and had a huge container full of fresh blueberries that he picked off of his land and just gave to me. Wow. Um, it was just, you know, stories like that. Just, um, I pulled off on another section. It was up um, in the upper peninsula of Michigan on, on Lake Michigan. It was a swampy land, um, just miles and miles of just swampy land. I pulled off on this one section and I was trudging through the swamp trying to find a dry land to pull my boat up to in the camp and this these people came down and said hey what are you doing on our land so i you know did my speech and gave them the cards and they're like just kind of stay in our house with us you know <laughs> so it was just it was just amazing just people are just so wonderful and um you know sometimes people say how could you trust a stranger how could you stay in a stranger's house weren't you ever afraid and no, I wasn't because you just get a vibe from people that they're just trying to you, honestly just be helpful. Yeah, you, you can kind of, you can tell when somebody's, yeah. you know, fishy or or if they're just yeah. a genuinely good person, you know. And like yeah. I said, most people, I like to think that most people are still got a good heart and, you know, really want to help people. So. Yeah. Right. Um, there, there was something I was going to, a road I was going to go down. Oh, um. The website, um, you, the website where you you were talking about where you put your stuff at. Uh, we want to make sure that we get that plugged in here before we get too far down the road here and forget about it. Uh, you're on Facebook and mm -hmm. you got your own website as well, correct? Mm -hmm. right, the website is called Just Around the Point. Okay. Point is P L I N T E, and um, so basically when I'm out paddling and I'm hurting and I'm tired, I say, I just need to get around the next point. I just need to get around the next point. So I made that um, the name of my website. That website, I haven't updated it for anything that I've done um, past the Great Lakes. You know, I've done the Mississippi River. I've done some other things. Mm -hmm. um, it is basically just the Great Lakes. Okay. And there's um, a section of um, all of the... I call them lake angels, all the people who helped me. There's a section of the, my team members who helped me. Um, there's um, videos and pictures, and, um, and there's, and there's pictures of like some really beautiful areas that I paddled through. So if you're interested in Great Lakes, if you're interested in the people that helped me, the website is just on the point. Okay, and they, uh, as well as Facebook, you, you've got uh, oh, yeah. Facebook as well. Yeah, Facebook, um, Facebook is much more updated. I post everything to Facebook if I'm out paddling, if I'm doing a trip. Like I did the Mississippi River last year. I paddled it in 55 days. There's tons and tons of pictures and updates about the Mississippi River. Uh, I'm currently living in Anchorage. I moved to Anchorage in October for a nursing job up here. And so there's tons of pictures of things that I've done in Anchorage paddling and, and horseback riding and, and glacier hiking. And I went to Kodiak Island. Um, just tons of stuff. Well, well speaking of being in, up in Alaska, and <laughs> we were alluding to the fact that there, there is a, another adventure coming. A little, a little, a little, a little, a little <laughs> adventure. 
Uh, before we go, we, we got to let you tell us this story about what's coming up. So um, there's a woman, a German woman, her name is Freya Hochmeister, and she is like, she was one of my role models. She's this incredibly strong uh, female uh, kayaker. She has kayaked um, all the way around Australia, the continent of Australia, uh, in, in a year. It only took her a year. She's done it fast. Only two people in history have ever done it. And, and the man, it took him uh, 13 months. She did it in 12 months. And um, she's paddled around the entire continent of South America. She's currently working on paddling around North America. I mean, she's amazing. She's paddled through, through things that that you and I would, would just vanish and never be seen again. I mean, she's just amazingly strong. And, and you talk about focus, being able to paddle through dangerous sections and remain focused. There's no one better at it than, than, than Freya. And so she put out on her, and I knew she was paddling around North America. And in the winter time, she paddles south, and in the summertime, she paddles north. And I knew that last year she stopped in Rain, uh, Wainwright, Alaska. And she's going to be paddling up around the north slope of Alaska and on into the northwest territories of Canada. So, so I saw on her um, po on her on her page that she was asking for a paddling partner to paddle the north slope of Alaska. So I sent her my paddling resume, um, but I felt like I was a little bit too late. I think I should have already found someone. Mm -hmm. But um, she she called me up on my on the phone. It's like so if you have a hero. That, that you admire, and all of a sudden your hero called you up on the phone. So I was a little tongue tied, but I was like, she was just like, so, you know, um, and she asked me a bunch of questions, and she was just this really warm, amazing person on the phone. And um, um, she said, you know, let me think about it. Maybe I'll have two paddling partners. Because you normally know, should either paddle solo, mm -hmm. or sometimes you paddle with one other paddling partner. And so she contacted me back and she said, yeah, I'm going to paddle with two people and you're one of them. So this is a huge opportunity to be able to paddle with someone who her knowledge is just limitless. I mean, she knows everything. There is no person that I will be safer paddling through this section with. This is an entirely remote area. There, there's no roads. Um, there might be a, uh, a native Alaskan village here or there. The only way to get to these villages is by plane. Um, and there's polar bears. Um, there's actually grizzly bears up that north, up that far north too. Um, and so, you know, and then you have the mud flats, you have the tides, the power on the ocean. So um, this is a huge opportunity and it's gonna be amazing the photography of this area is just going to be amazing and the stories are just going to be phenomenal and the amount of knowledge that I'm going to learn from Freya is just, I can't even put it in words. I mean, this is a huge, huge opportunity for me to become a much better paddler. So when do you start? Uh, I am starting on July 1st. And so I'm going to meet her in, in Bell. The, the native word for it is Yucatan. I can't say the name of course very well, but it's basically Barrel, B-A-R-R-O-W. It's the far, it's called the top of the world for the United States. There's no place further north um, than Barrel, and um, I believe it's like 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle. That's a hike. Wow. Yeah. I actually flew up there before I knew anything about Powell and Australia. Uh, living in Anchorage, uh, on my days off, I try to explore all of Alaska. And I actually flew up there in February for a couple of days, and it was like minus 45 degrees up there. I took some pictures of under some whale bones and stuff. But yeah, you, you really couldn't stay outside for very long. You had to be very well protected to be outside. So you're going up July 1st. What is the yeah. average temperature there July 1st? Uh, it's going to be about um, 38 to 45 degrees, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's gonna, it's, it'll be above freezing. The plan is to, I will be paddling, Freya is starting in Wainwright. So she's about, she's going to be paddling about 100 miles more than me. But right now the plan is that I'll be paddling the last 800 miles with her. Okay. Um, from uh, Val all the way up into the 
the beginning of the north uh, northwest territories of Canada. Wow. Um, so it's all along the north slope of Alaska. And um, it's going to be some really amazing um, scenery and just the wildlife is just going to be phenomenal. I mean, it's gonna, you're going to see seals and, and I was told that there's a lot of killer whales up there too. Okay. Um, just the wildlife is just going to be phenomenal. And just to be able to paddle with someone who I respect so much, there's no, there's no price for that. There's no words for that. When you're paddling in open water like that, and you're you're going for distance, and you know you're mm -hmm. making these stops, how far offshore are you average? Are you staying? Well, this is Freya's expedition, so I'm going to do what what she tells me to do. But when I'm doing my own expedition, like um, on the Great Lakes, I I was comfortable being about a mile offshore, okay. and sometimes I would even be two miles offshore. Okay. Just, because uh, because on the Great Lakes you're going from point to point to point, and so you don't want to be like hugging the shoreline and going into the bays. Right. And usually the points are going to be cliffs, and so you don't want to be too close to the cliffs because of the rebound. Mm -hmm. um, so I would usually find myself uh, as as I'm going across the bay, I'd usually be like about two miles out. And across the points, I might be like half a mile or one mile out. Sometimes I would get too far out, and I'd have to start, you know, aiming my belt closer to land. But I, I don't know what it's going to be like paddling with Freya. It's, it's her expedition, and basically I'm there to learn, and I'll do what she tells me to do. Well, going along with this, this expedition, uh, as we get towards the end of the show here, how, how would people be able to follow this? I, you had mentioned to us before the show that... Uh, that she's going to be able to do some posting along the way. Mm -hmm. Where would somebody that wants to follow this, where would they be able to find it? So she has a website, but um, to me the best way to follow would be on Facebook. Okay. Um, it's if you, you have to follow her. She's got two Facebook pages just like I do. She has her, her private page and her public page. You need to follow on the public page. It's called Freya Hoffmeister Athlete. And you okay. have to follow her. If, if you see her page, it says Freya Hoffmeister friend request. That's the wrong one. Mm -hmm. it has to be Freya Hoffmeister athlete, and you just hit follow. And she has um, a satellite phone, um, and she does um, a lot of um, stories and updates and daily blogs. She does a lot of daily blogs. She has a website too um, that you can go to Freya Hoffmeister. Um, and you can basically read the same daily blogs. I just okay. always would keep up with her off of Facebook. Okay. All right. So we're going to have to tune into that as, as well and, uh, and how, follow your adventure. How long do you think this is going to take you when you start it's gonna be, July 1st? Yeah, I'm planning on being out there for two months. Okay. So all of, all of July and August. Um, and so, you know, if it's, it's her expedition, it's her call. Uh, my plan is that I can be out there for two months, and I actually have um, set my life up to be able to be out there for three months. So it just depends on her and what she decides if she wants to push further or if she doesn't want to push further. Um, but I'm I'm prepared to be out there for three months. But I believe the plan is two months. Okay. And um, because I planned on actually doing the Missouri River this year, and so I had the time set aside and the finances set aside. Um, to do the Missouri River, so um, yeah, but I'm just, but it's just going to be so amazing to be on the north slope of Alaska, and just the amount of wildlife and the polar bears, and um, someone told me that works on the north slope, he said expect to see about three or four polar bears a week, and hopefully he said smile, and hopefully you see them when you're in your belt and not when you're in camp. <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> good advice. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, I'll be doing updates too on my Facebook page, just around the point. Um, I'll be posting pictures and updates every, as long as I have cell service. Gotcha. Um, but if I don't have cell service, then following Freya would be the best way to do the, uh, read the daily blogs. Well, it sounds like you got to have her back towards the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you get back and you get settled back in, and you you'd like to talk about that trip. You definitely got to let us know because we'd love that'd to have you back on. That'd be great. I'd love to tell you all the stories. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but looking looking ahead past that, is there anything mm -hmm. that's on your radar? 
Yeah, there's a lot of things on my radar. Um, if Claire asks me to come back, I would love to go back and power with her. Um, I'm looking at powering the Inside Passage and the Yukon River. Um, I'm calling that Expedition Points North. And, you know, powering the Missouri River is still on my radar, but um, the Missouri River will always be there, and this is an opportunity I can't um, pass, you know, walk away from. But there's a section on the Missouri River called the Breaks. It's about 160 miles, and it's just amazingly beautiful. Um, I've only seen pictures. I've never been there. So if um, if we get if I get done with Clay's expedition, um, and I, I still have September that I can paddle, I might just go paddle the the breaks on the Missouri River in September. So it's just up in the air. I'm just it's like laissez faire. Whatever happens, happens, and I'm just gonna flow with it. Go enjoy yourself. You gotta go with the crap. <laughs> yeah. So to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great, ha you know, inviting me on here. It was great talking to you guys. Thank you. Well, oh, we appreciate it. Absolutely. That's a little insight into some, some extreme, uh, what I call extreme outdoors. I, I just, I love picking people's brains yeah. about that, the training they go through, and it's uh, the ups and downs and everything. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it, it takes a special person to be able to do stuff like that. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the mindset. Well, the, 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 uh, you just said the mental mindset. When yeah. You, when you're out there paddling, you can't see land. What is she? I, I'm imagining her singer do, singing to herself, mm -hmm. <laughs> playing mind, you know, to, to, to get from point A to point B. Well, it's just like uh, the people yeah. that are on uh, the show alone. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they put, put 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 them out there. Kodiak Island was one of the places they went. Yeah. And I applied, I applied for that show, by the way. Did you? <laughs> did you? Get I never heard, no, I never heard nothing back, but okay. I did. I did apply. <laughs> well, there was a guy from Michigan who won season four or five. Yep, we had Somewhere. him on the show. Yeah, we had him on the show yeah. and talked to him. And it's the mind. The mind is yeah. the biggest thing to overcome in in extreme situations. And it's not the body. Uh, I think it's the rule of forty they talk mm -hmm. about with uh, the SEAL team. That once mm -hmm. you hit the wall, uh, you still got forty percent left in the tank. Physically, it's the mental game that, that gets most people. Yeah, so. and that's what it was paddling the Great Lakes. Just with my rheumatoid arthritis, you know, there'd be days you're waking up and you're hurting and your hands are swollen, mm -hmm. and I would just be like, I've got one more day left in me, so let's get my butt out there and let's get going. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. But the other thing I'd like to say is, if anyone has any questions about paddling the Great Lakes or any any questions at all related to paddling, I try to be very approachable. If you um, send me a message on Facebook, I'm, I always try to answer people's questions. There you go. So everybody that's listening out there, you know, once again, as we always say, you know, make sure you go over, follow, like, share, social media, uh, the show, uh, you know, for, for her pages, uh, the website as well, all that stuff. And make sure you, you follow this next adventure uh, up around the North Slope. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I really want to know what that's like up there because I'll I don't know that I'll ever get that far north I love the yeah, north country yeah. but man that's a long way yeah <laughs> so well, you you enjoy that that's you enjoy that and, and hopefully we can talk to you at the end of the year when everything well if it settles down for you and right. we'll have you back on the show and we'll see how the little brown duck did yeah. <laughs> that's right That'd be great. Thank you. I look forward to that. All right. Well, just hang on uh, after the show here, and we'll chat uh, briefly. But uh, for everybody yeah. out there that's that's listening to us on the podcast, uh, make sure you go over to iTunes. If you're listening on iTunes, go over and give us a like, follow, share, review over there as well. That helps the people who support us. And uh, you got to listen or come back over to YouTube and watch the live show or on Facebook because there's – conversation in the breaks that you don't get on the podcast absolutely you miss a lot of it and you, if you don't <laughs> come back to the video side of it you, you just you, there you go it pieces together sometimes things you hear on the podcast for you that you where did they come up with that right <laughs> so, so. but uh, that's going to do it for us this week make sure you, you go to our social media sites as well give us a like follow share and share the show for us that's going to do it for us this week. Next week, we got anything on? Next week, we have, we're going to be talking all about turkey hunting. Oh, that's right. That's right. We're going to be yep. talking with Dan, Dan Prince. Prince. Uh, he gave the seminar last week at the NWTF Flint River uh, Chapter seminar. So we're going to have him on the show, and we're going to talk to him everything about turkey hunting. He is a retired Michigan DNR officer. And we get a story out of him or two. You think so? Yeah. All right. I think so. He's yeah. a good guy. All right. That's going to do it for us this week, folks. Y'all take care. We'll be back again next Wednesday night at 730. See you then.